All right, so today's going to be a lecture on debugging. And I just wanted to first talk about what I look at debugging as. And so I think as debugging as being able to sit in a room that's on fire and being able to say, this is OK. We will be able to take care of this, just calmly grab some buckets of water, pour it all on the fire, everything will be fine. And the reason why I wanted to talk about debugging today especially is because I like to think that debugging is one of the biggest deterrents of people away from CS. People will face their first large bug in computer science, and immediately they'll go as far as saying they're not cut out to do computer science because they can't solve a bug. Being able to debug is an incredibly important skill. It'll allow you to be a self-sufficient programmer. And also, everyone goes through it. No matter how experienced of a programmer you are, you will have to debug at some point. Some more often than others, but don't get terrified over needing to debug. Don't think you're not cut out for computer science or something because you're not as strong as debugging as some other people that might be more experienced. And so as a testament to that, I put in this quote that I saw on Reddit a couple days ago from a CS professor here. His name is Wade Fagan. Uh, some of you might have had him already. Some of you might never have him. He's currently leading a data science initiative at the University of Illinois. Wade Fagan is probably one of the best CS professors in the world. And he got a 4.0 in his undergrad. He's extremely intelligent. He had a very profound impact on every course that he's touched. The guy is just a legend. And he says this about debugging. Debugging sucks. I hate it. Tools, IDEs, debuggers, etc., make it easier. But it still sucks. Finding a bug can take hours just to fix one line of code. I try everything I can to avoid needing to debug. And so this is Wade Fagan. Again, CS God. But everyone needs to debug. So don't get terrified over this concept. And so I want to actually touch on two things that he said. He said one major point, which is that tools, IDEs, make it easier, but it still sucks. And also, he tries everything he can to avoid needing to do it in the first place. So the second point I want to just touch on very quickly, before we even learn how to debug, how can we avoid needing to debug in the first place? So this isn't a software design class, so I don't want to spend too much time on this. But my biggest advice for you is to test often. Don't just write a gazillion lines of code and then hit run once and hope that it'll magically work. Make sure that as you're writing your tests, make sure that as you're writing your code, you test every, now, every so often every small piece of functionality. So that way, when you build on top of each other, you're not just building a train wreck. Think of building a house. When, when construction workers are building a house, they're not going to build the first floor of their house and say, eh, it looks about right to me. Build 30 more floors and say, all right, it's time to test. Let's, uh, let's see how this house is going to hold up. That's not at all how it works. They test very often. They make sure that every piece of functionality that they're implementing, every floor, is still very sturdy and structured well. It's the same thing with programming. Make sure that every small piece of functionality that you're writing is something that works. That way, you're not just building off your own assumptions. But again, this isn't a software design class. You'll learn about this more in CS126 or CS242 if you're a transfer student into CS. That, that they will touch on this more. But today's about debugging. How can we make debugging a little less painful than it is? But in reality, it will always be painful, in my opinion. So problems in with computer science and things that you need to debug, it usually boils down to this idea you have a lot of incorrect, incorrect assumptions that you make inside of your head about what your code does. And so there is not really any, an algorithm that you can run in your head to debug your code and just follow certain steps along the way, and you'll be able to fix any issue that you have. Instead, what I can give you is a toolbox of a lot of different tools that you can have that you can pick and choose from depending on the situation when you're debugging your own code. And they're all tackling this issue. Being able to tackle the incorrect assumptions that you have about your code. Being able to challenge your assumptions and make sure that when you're building your code, you have a strong house, for example. So let's go ahead and start off with, again, this toolbox. And the first tool that we have is print line debugging. This is one of the most basic ways of debugging your code. And it's actually quite powerful. You just basically put print lines throughout your code to make sure what your outputs are, to see if you're reaching certain areas, so these are various questions that you could ask yourself. Am I even entering this function? Well, if you put a print line in that function, you can see. Why is this value null here? Well, 
you put a print line there, you can see exactly why. How many elements are in my array here? Again, put a print line and you'll find out. So I'm going to do a quick demo of this, just being able to do basic print line debugging to solve a bug. So I'm going to start off by first describing this uh, problem that we're trying to solve. So here's the problem right here. I pulled this off of LeetCode, uh, LeetCode.com. It's a nice website for very, basic, for very basic interview problems and also very complex ones. The, these are basically the easiest problems that, could, that I could find on the website. And fun fact about this problem, it's actually one of the most popular, I believe the most popular problem that interviewers give very early on in the interview process just to weed out very you know, inexperienced programmers. So we're writing a program that can output the string representation of numbers from 1 to n. And for each number, if it is a multiple of 3, we're going to output fizz. If it is a multiple of 5, we'll output buzz. And if it is both a multiple of 3 and 5, we output fizz buzz. So for example, our input is 15. So from 1 to 15, our output's going to be 1, because 1 is both not a multiple of 3 and 5. 2, same reasoning. 3 is a multiple of 3, so we output fizz. 4, 5 is a multiple of 5, so we output buzz, so on and so forth. 9 is a multiple of 3, so we say fizz. And then 15, fizz buzz. So here is some code that does almost the right thing to do when it comes to tackling this problem. It just barely, uh, it almost works, but it doesn't quite. So let's go ahead and walk through it very quickly. We said that if the number is both a multiple of 3 and 5, then we output fizzbuzz. If the, multiple, if the number is a multiple of 3, then we output fizz. And if it's just a multiple of 5, we output buzz. And if it doesn't fall into any of those categories, we're just going to output the number. Uh, and very quickly, just a quick note, uh, an informal introduction to vectors. This is a vector of strings. What is a vector? It's just basically a resizable array. For now, that's all it is. And in this problem, we're going to treat it just like an array. So we'll give a more formal introduction to vectors. But for now, this is all it really is. So we're going to loop from 1 to n, checking if each value from 1 to n is a multiple of 3 and a multiple of 5. So I have no idea why this doesn't work. So how am I going to tackle this issue? I can, I can pick up my laptop and you know, go to office hours and say, Mr. Core Staff, um, it doesn't work. Can you help me? You can uh, respond to the questions that they ask you, where they say, well, what's wrong? You say, it doesn't work. In this case, I want you to try print line debugging. So first, let me actually try some inputs. So let's say in the main function, I just call the function with an input 1, just to see what it's going to give me. So here is the output. We see that for 1, it's giving me an empty list. But it shouldn't be giving me an empty list. It should be giving me 1, because 1 is both down a multiple of 3 and 5. So if I look here, I don't quite exactly know why that's happening. The function's not working. And where it should be is right here. Because when I input 1 into this program, it should say, it's not this, it's not this, it's not this, so it's this. So let's see. Are we even getting to this point in our program? Let's put a print line. And we'll see what's up. So I'm going to run it again. We'll see that we're again getting this empty list but I'm not getting any output from the console. I'm not saying, is this working? So we know that we're not entering this if statement. So I say, OK, well, are we even entering the loop at all? Let's see. So if I run it again, we'll see again. We're just getting this empty list. And I don't see the print line anywhere in the console. So we're not even entering this for loop. Well, is our function even working at all? Let's find out. I can put a print line here. Cargo run. OK, so we do see that we are entering the function. 
just as a sanity check, this is working. So we're not entering the for loop. Why are we not entering the for loop? Well, if we, again, just for the sake of testing, keep this here, I guess now we can look at our bounds. Because we know that we're not entering the for loop due to our print line debugging. So what's wrong with our bounds, maybe? We said we're looping from 1 to n. Well, now we realize, well, actually, when we say n is 1, with the way that for loops work, it's going to say 1 is not less than 1. So we're not even going to enter this for loop at all. So what I can do to solve this issue is just say loop from 1 to n plus 1. And if I run it again, we'll see that we're outputting the list of 1. And we're actually entering the for loop. And as I increase uh, the number of inputs, let's say instead of from 1 to 1, we can say 1 to, for example, 15, like the problem statement. If I run this, we can see, what does that mean? Let's try that again. OK, I have no clue what just happened. But we can see that this is the correct list that we saw in the problem statement. And so we were able to do that by using just very basic print line statements. And so print line statements, there are a bit of issues with them. They're not the end-all, be-all of debugging. And we did the demo. So what's wrong with print line debugging? They are very useful and they are very powerful, but they are a bit slow. If you realize that you need to move or add a print line statement, you need to recompile every code. You saw that I ran cargo run at least six times there. And you need to completely relaunch your application. So you have to keep on running it over and over again. And they are actually something that is a part of the code. So what does this mean? Well, we're changing the line numbers around. If we're using version control, Git is going to say you have modifications to the file when really you don't. And it can even affect the performance and or behavior, because print line statements actually do take time. And so when you have a bunch of print line statements throughout your code, it can not only get very messy, but also it can slow things down quite a bit. And then lastly, they are a bit limited. And we'll see how they're a bit limited later on when I introduce the idea of debuggers. But for now, these are the cons of print line debugging. Now, with that said, I do know quite a, people, quite a bit of people that have gone years developing just with print line debugging alone. So it is quite powerful. But there are better ways of going about doing things. So we already showed that. So now, another tool for your toolbox, rubber duck debugging. Now, some of you are going to laugh at this concept. But Rubber duck debugging is something that actually many of you have probably already done. When I was younger and I was looking for, let's say, something in the fridge, I wanted a bottle of ketchup. I would look all over the place for this bottle of ketchup, but I wouldn't be able to find it. So what, I, what would I do? I would go to the living room. I would annoy and bug my mom. I would say, Mom, I need to find this ketchup bottle. Can you come help me? And the poor lady, she's comfortable on the couch. She's watching TV, and I'm interrupting her time. She comes to the kitchen, and I'm like, all right, mom. So I looked in the fridge. I looked through the first row. I looked behind the milk carton. I couldn't find it. Second row, somewhere in the back. Oh, sorry, mom. It's right there. OK, so uh, let me grab the ketchup bottle. And my mom is so mad at me. But this is rubber duck debugging. So it's a name in reference to the story in the book, The Programmic Programmer, in which a programmer would just carry around a rubber duck and debug their code by forcing themselves to explain it line by line to the rubber duck. So you might think that this guy is a maniac, but it's actually quite genius. Because this style of debugging is something that is very powerful. So here's some more uh, rubber ducks. So here's from Wikipedia. Many programmers have had the experience of explaining a problem to someone else, possibly even someone who knows nothing about programming and then hitting upon the solution in the process of explaining the problem. This is something many of you have already probably done. In describing what the code is supposed to do and observing what it actually does, any incongruity between these two becomes apparent. More generally, teaching a subject forces its evaluation from different perspectives and can provide a deeper understanding. By using an inanimate object, the programmer can try to accomplish this without having to interrupt anyone else. So, sorry, Mom. But 
let's do a quick demo. And actually, so I don't have a rubber duck, but I have a penguin. So we'll use a penguin. So I'm going to quickly comment out this code, and we'll move over to this function. So this function here is another problem that I got off leak code. And it is also a very simple question that some companies will ask very early on in their interview process just to weed people out. So we're given an array of numbers. And what we need to return is whether or not, or actually how many numbers are of even length. So here, this list would output 2 because 12 is 2 digits long. 345 is 3 digits long. That doesn't count. But 7,896 uh, 7, is a number of even length. So we have two numbers of even length. And so the purpose of this function is to solve this problem. So here is a function that is broken. And so if I was doing rubber duck debugging, I would grab my rubber duck, or whatever it is. As you might have noticed by now, it doesn't actually have to be a rubber duck. It can be whatever inanimate object or even another human. And we can say, OK, so uh, for this problem, I want to take in this array of numbers. And for each number, I want to check whether or not it is of even or odd length. And so here is my approach. I'm taking in a vector of numbers. And I'm initializing the number of even numbers to 0. And I'm going to loop through this number array. And for each element, I'm going to check if it is even. So now here, some of you might have realized already, I've actually realized it due to rubber duck debugging. I'm realizing that here's my mistake. I'm checking if the value of each number is even, but not the length of each number. So here, 346, for example, is an even number, but it contains three digits. And that's what the problem's actually looking for. And so since this has an odd number of digits, it shouldn't be counted. But instead, it is. So this function is actually just wrong. The solution to this problem can be done by abusing this little fact here. So the inputs to the function can be at most 10 to the fifth, which is, in other words, represented like this. And we can say that the solution can just abuse that fact by saying between 1 and this number, the only way to represent an even number is numbers that have two digits long, four digits long, and six digits long. Because we can't represent numbers bigger than the input that it's giving us. So this function doesn't work. And we realized why it doesn't work due to, again, rubber duck debugging. I went through this function line by line, and I described in great detail what it's trying to do and what it's trying to accomplish. And after that, I realized what was wrong. I found the bottle of ketchup. So here is a function that tries to accomplish the solution that I talked about just a minute ago. And what I would like is for one of you to rubber duck debug this code. This code does not work, and there are a couple of issues in this code that I would like for at least one of you to point out through rubber duck debugging. Um, is anyone willing to do it without extra credit? Anyone? Just raise your hand, let me know. OK, that's what I thought. So 1% extra credit on your final grade if you rubber duck debug this code. Raise your hand. There you go. All right. So I'm just going to correct you really quick. It's saying uh, greater than 9, less than 100. Yeah. All 
Okay, so that is indeed a mistake. So this, this and and should be an or. We said there are a couple cases where the number will be even, right? It'll be of length 2, of length 4, or of length 6. And so for the number, for the, what we're allowing for the input of this function, 10, um, 100,000 is the greatest that the number can be. So here, this would be the only way that it could be a number of six digit length. So that's even. But there is another issue with this code. Would you like to keep going? Uh, 100,000. So that part is correct. So it is checking if it's less than 10,000, right? With, within that quantity, we're saying, is it less than 10,000 or something else? So two issues there. Someone else raise their hand. You raise your hand. So that's completely correct. So in that quantity, we're trying to see if the number is four digits long. And so the way that we're doing this is by saying, is it greater than 999 and also less than 10,000? Because that is the only way we could have a digit of four length. So as he pointed out, this is incorrect. And this or is incorrect because we want it to be within the two bounds. So the first condition has to be satisfied, and the second condition has to be satisfied. So this should be changed to an and. And that solves our problem. This code is now functioning. So if we want to run through it one more time, we're taking in this numbers array, and we're just going to check for each element. Is it two digits long, a.k.a. is it greater than 9, less than 100? Is it four digits long, a.k.a. greater than 999, less than 10,000? Or is it six digits long, which is strictly equal to 100,000? And so for each element that satisfies those constraints, we will increment num even by one. Does anyone have any questions about this? So the reason why we were able to find those problems is because at first glance, it looked like it was kind of right. But by rubber duck debugging it, by walking through it line by line with great detail, we were able to very quickly find out what the issue was. So that is rubber duck debugging. So now I want to show another tool. And this is the use of a debugger. And so debuggers are actually very, very powerful tools. They, you can use them in GUIs visually in your IDE or text editor, or you can use them within the command line. Today I'm just going to show the very basic use of a debugger within an IDE, or rather a text editor. I'll be using VS Code. And what they allow you to do is set breakpoints throughout your code and automatically trace through your code with them. So you can see how earlier what we were, what we were doing is kind of simulating these breakpoints by using print line statements. But instead what we can do, if I open up my text editor, so I'm not going to go through how to set up a debugging tool. You can very easily Google that. Um, I'm just going to show you really the basic use case of how to use one by yourself. So here I just have a function. Nothing's wrong with the function, but I just want to show you what happens when we use a debugger. So the way that we use a debugger is by setting what are called breakpoints. And so in VS Code, it looks like this. And in many text editors or IDEs, this is what it looks like. You can also do this from the terminal or command line, but I'm not going to be showing that today. So you want to set these breakpoints. So let's say I set one here. And what this breakpoint is basically saying is, run this program like usual, but when you get to this breakpoint, stop. Because I want to be able to control the flow of the program beyond this point. And another caveat is that you want to put these breakpoints on lines that actually have code on them. So for example, here, line 98, there's really no point of putting a breakpoint because there's nothing there. So. In VS Code, I have this ability to run this start debugging uh, button. And actually, really quickly, let me run cargo build. 
the cargo build will give me an executable that the debugger can use to run. So when I click this button, you'll see that it's going to run my program like usual, but once I get to that breakpoint there, it's going to stop. And it's going to allow me to control the flow of this program beyond this point. And so what is this useful for? Well, if you look at the side here, you can see that we can see the state of the variables at this point in the program. And if I want to keep walking through the program step by step, I can use this button called step over. And there's two other buttons here. We have step into and step out. Step into will allow you to step into a function. Step out will allow you to step out of a function. But really, the most useful one is this step over button. So here, our test is equal to 0. We knew that. n is equal to 10, because that was the input to our function. So when we step over, we're basically, as you can see over here, uh, on the left here, we can see the state of our variables. So I'm just going to keep on clicking through this. So it's going to trace through my code. It's going to increment the variables as I go. So test is now equal to 1. And this extra stuff here, don't worry too much about it. It's just an iterator, which is basically the way that Rust handles this for loop. You don't have to worry about it too much right now. Just focus on these values here. And then also val is how Rust is handling the right side of this um, assignment operator. It's calculating that value, and then it's assigning it into test. So if I keep stepping over my code, we can see that i is incrementing. We can see that test is being updated with a new value. And I can just keep on going, keep on going. And you guys get the point. And so this is very useful for being able to track what the state of our program is. You can set breakpoints throughout your code and see what's going on a little bit more explicitly. And you can see how this is actually a bit more clean than using print line debugging because we're not actually writing anything into the code and we don't have to keep on recompiling it over and over again. We're able to just set these breakpoints and let the debugger do its work. Another caveat is that you can obviously set multiple breakpoints. So I can set one here if I'd like. I can set one in the main function, and it'll just basically run my program as usual. I don't think I actually clicked there. Yeah. So I can just run my program as usual, and every single time it hits a breakpoint, then it'll just stop and tell me you can continue it from here on out. So does anyone have any questions on debuggers or anything that we've covered so far? OK. So let me just continue. That was the demo. So now we have Professor Google. Oh, do you have a question? Yeah. Yeah. Um. So that might be specific to the debugger that you're using. Yeah, I've never used the IntelliJ debugger. Uh, it might be specific to the debugger you're using, but uh, I could try to get back to you on that. Yeah. Any other questions? OK. So Professor Google. Google is the greatest. It is how you will find Stack Overflow pages. It is how you will find GitHub issue pages. You will find all of the answers to your problems, whether they are programming related or anything else, on Google. So use Google. Seriously, use Google. Take your error message and put it in Google. Describe what you think your problem is and put it in Google. There are so many of the problems that you face day to day when you're programming that can so easily be solved by just Googling what your problem is. And I'm saying this because I'm sure many of you have just gotten an error message, picked up your laptop, walked over to office hours, and said, sir or ma'am, it doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Well, it's just not working. Can you figure it out? You want to be able to be a self-sufficient programmer. And so I don't want to scare you guys over what it's like in industry or something. Depending on the company you work at, 
Some communities are a bit more collaborative than others. But even if you're working in a collaborative environment, you must be able to succeed in self-sufficiency. You can't have someone babysit you at all times. And so one of the ways that you can accomplish this is through Googling. Use Google, please. And so with that, we're going to do a Google scavenger hunt on Kahoot, where the winner will get, or rather top five, will get 1% extra credit. It'll be six questions. Some of them, you might have an idea of what the problem is. Some of them, you will definitely have to Google what the problem is. And you will have longer time for the questions because, obviously, they won't be at the top of your head. So join in. Uh, there's the code. Top five extra credit. Get in here. So the first question, you'll have, I believe, two minutes. So Git's yelling at me. It's saying, error, unable to read tree object head. What does this mean? What do I do? You have two minutes. Google is at your disposal. Use it. Some of you are already answering, so I'm guessing you're just legends. Also, very peaceful Kahoot music. I've never heard this before. Very nice. Reminds me of Minecraft. very tempted to just click skip. Um, how many people have been in this? Okay. There we go. Well done, guys. I'm pretty sure, I mean, I looked, at, I looked at this up myself, and I'm pretty sure the one on the top right is like the only one you would find. Um, yeah, so that's the answer. I honestly don't even remember what it does, but that's the beauty of Stack Overflow. You can use things that you don't fully understand. Oh, that's cool. Nice scoreboard. All right. So I'm stuck in Vim. I can't close it. What do I do? This one only 60 seconds because some of you might already know the answer.
so if you're here for the bash lectures, that is the answer. And uh, that is what Google will tell you. Uh, clicking the escape key won't quite get you out of it entirely. The next question, here's the scoreboard. That is a very cool feature. Nice, nice job, Kahoot. So when I type echo path, this is a bash question, it will return my path. But I don't want to do that. I just want to do the word, dollar sign path. Instead, it is doing the variable. So what does the dollar, how can we echo just the dollar sign? This is really annoying. How do I do it? Professor Google, what do I do? How do I do it? command from the question copied and pasted into an answer. Um, and the other two are just wrong. Stack Overflow will tell you this one. And that's how you basically do escape sequences, escape characters in Bash. So well done to the 26 of you. Scoreboard. So more Bash questions. I'm using CD, DIR, touch new file, but I see no file in my new directory. Does it not work? What does that even do? Google, help me. You guys have a minute and a half for this question. Music is very intense. I like it. logical or is just like what you would see in a programming language, where if the first one is true, the second half just won't execute at all. So here we have CD, DIR. That will be successful. We will change into that new directory. And so the second half just won't be executed at all. So that's why you're not seeing a new file in your new directory, because we're not actually executing the touch command. We're just doing CD. Does anyone have any questions about this? So. The OR operator only does the second command if the first one fails. Scoreboard. So Python. So this just goes to show that you don't have to have any clue what's going on to get your answer from Google. Some of you probably have never even seen Python code. So my code does result is equal to this function, and it's not working. 
the compiler is just shouting its lungs out at me. What do I do? How will I do this? Google, can you please help me? Okay, very well done. So again, you don't need to know a bunch about something to be able to Google about it. Uh, blue is the correct answer. The eval function will have to take in a string or two other types that you won't really see very often. Uh, definitely not what this is up here. So well done. One more question. Here's the leaderboard. So I'm trying to SSH into my UIUC virtual machine, but it says that my NetID can't be found. Help me. What will I do? done again. So I think the answer to that is on like one of our course websites. Um, yeah, that's, that's how you do it. You do your net ID at whatever the host URL is. And if you were here for one of the bash lectures, SSH is what you use to, for example, go into a virtual machine from your computer. So that's the Google scavenger hunt. Let's have our very dramatic podium. Third place. First place. Very nice. Uh, those are the runner up. So, one beautiful piece of extra credit for all of you. Get out of here. So, those are all the slides for today. So, I hope this gave you guys some tools, some tips, and tricks for being able to tackle these issues on your own. If you have an issue in your code, you can use a combination of print line debugging, rubber duck debugging, using a debugger on your IDE or terminal. You can use Google. You can do all of these different things to try and get a better idea of what's going on in your code. The more self-sufficient you are as a programmer, the better programmer you are. And this goes beyond just software engineering. 
If you become a theoretician, for example, you will have to debug things. If you are just some sort of engineer, you will have to debug things. Debugging is all throughout many different disciplines, many different careers. It is a very, very useful to ha uh, tool to have, very useful skill to have. And I hope this was helpful. Any announcements? No announcements for today. So have a wonderful Tuesday. Thank you.